directed by Dale Grothman. Tromerai by Charles Beaumont. At the sound, Henry Ritchie's hand jerked. Most of the martinis sloshed over his robe. He jumped up, swabbed furiously at the spots. God damn it! Hank! His wife slammed her book together. Well, what do you expect? That confounded buzzer is a perfectly natural, normal buzzer. You're just terribly upset, dear. No, Mr. Ritchie said. I am not just terribly upset, dear. For seven years I've been listening to that banshee's wail every time someone wants in. Well, I'm through. Either it goes. All right, all right, Mrs. Ritchie said. You don't have to make a production out of it. Well? Well, what? Mr. Ritchie sighed ponderously, glared at his wife, set what was left of the martini down on the table, and went to the door. He slipped the chain. Be this the master of the halfway house? Mr. Ritchie opened the door. Max, what the devil are you doing up at this hour? A large man, well built, in his forties, walked in, smiling. I could ask you the same question, he said, flinging his hat and scarf in the direction of the chair. But I'm far too thoughtful. They went back into the living room. Mrs. Ritchie looked up, frowned. Oh, swell, she said. Dandy. All we need now is a bridge four. Ruth just terribly upset, Mr. Ritchie said. Well, the large man said, it's nice to see unanimity in this house for once, anyway. Hi, Ruth. He walked over to the bar and found the martini mix and drained the jar's contents into a glass. Then he drained the glass. Take it easy. Max Kaplan turned to face his hosts. He looked quite a bit older than usual. The grin wasn't boyish now. Dear folksies, he said, when I die, I don't want to see any full bottles around. Oh, ha, ha, that's just so very deliriously funny, Mrs. Ritchie said. She was massaging her temples. I'm glad to see her ladyship abused, Kaplan followed Mr. Ritchie's gaze. Hickory dickory dock. The mice look up at the clock. Oh, shut up. Oops, sorry. The big man mixed up a new batch silently, then refilled the three glasses. He sat down. The clock's tick, a deep, sharp bass sound, got louder and louder in the room. Kaplan rested his head on the couch arm. Less than an hour, he said. Not even an hour. I knew it, Mrs. Ritchie stood up. I knew it the minute you walked in. We're not nervous enough. Oh, no. Now we've got to listen to the great city editor and his news behind the news. Very well. Kaplan rose shakily. He was drunk. It showed now. Well, if I'm not welcome here, then I shall go elsewhere to breathe my last. Never mind, Mrs. Ritchie said. Sit down. I've had a stomach full of this wake. If you two insist on sitting here until X hour like a couple of ghouls, well, that's your business. I'm going to bed and to sleep. What a woman, Kaplan muttered, polishing off the martini. Nerves of chilled steel. Mrs. Ritchie looked at her husband for a moment. Then she said, Good night, dear, and started for the door. See you in the morning, Mr. Ritchie said. Get a good sleep. Then Max Kaplan giggled. Yeah, a real good sleep. Mrs. Ritchie left the room. The big man fumbled for a cigarette. He glanced at the clock. Hank, for Christ's sake. Henry Ritchie sighed and slumped into a chair. I tried, Max. Did you? Did you try? I mean, with everything? With everything. Might as well face it, the boy's going to burn right on schedule. Kaplan opened his mouth. Forget it. The governor isn't about to issue a commutation. 
with the public's blood up the way it is he knows what it would mean to his vote we were stupid even to try lousy vultures Richie shrugged they're hungry max you forget there hasn't been an execution in this state for over two years they're hungry so a poor dumb kid's gonna fry alive in order for them to get their kicks wait a second now don't get carried away this same poor dumb kid is the boy who killed George Sanderson in cold blood and then raped his wife not too very long ago if I recall your word for him then was brutal murderer that was the paper this is you and me well get that accusatory look off your face murder and rape those are stiff raps to beat pal you did it with Beatty you got him off Kaplan reminded his friend luck public mood Beatty was an old man feeble look Max why don't you stop beating around the bush okay Kaplan said slowly they let me in this afternoon I talked with him again Richie nodded and Hank I'm telling you it gives me the creeps I swear it does what did he tell you Kaplan puffed on his cigarette nervously keeping his eyes on the clock he was lying down when I went in curled up tight trying to sleep go on when he heard me he came to Kaplan he said you've got to make them believe me you've got to make them understand his eyes got real big then and Hank I'm scared of what I don't know just him maybe I'm not sure he's carrying the same line yeah but worse this time more intense somehow Richie tried to keep the smile he remembered all right much too well the whole story was crazy normally enough to get the kid off with a life sentence in the criminally insane ward but it was a little too crazy so the psychiatrist wouldn't buy it can't get his words out of my mind Kaplan was saying his eyes were closed mister tell them tell them if they kill me you'll all die this whole world of yours will die because Richie remembered you don't exist any of you except in my mind don't you see I'm asleep and dreaming all of this you your wives your children it's all part of my dream and when you kill me then I'll wake up and that will be the end of you well Richie said it's original Kaplan shook his head come on Max snap out of it you act like you've never listened to a lunatic before people have been predicting the end of the world since the year one sure I know you don't have to patronize me it's just that well who is this particular lunatic anyway we don't know any more about him than the day he was caught even the name we had to make up who is he where'd he come from what's his home my home a world of eternities an eternity of worlds I must destroy hurt kill before I wake always and then once more I must sleep always always look there's a hundred vagrants in every city just like our boy no name no friends no relatives then he doesn't seem in the least odd to you is that it is that what you're telling me so he's odd I've never met a murderer that wasn't Richie recalled the lean hairless face the expressionless eyes the slender youthful body that moved in strange hesitant jerks the halting voice the clock bonged the quarter hour fifteen to twelve max Kaplan wiped the perspiration from his forehead and besides Richie said somewhat too loudly it's plain ridiculous he says what we're a dream he's having right 
Okay, then what about our parents? And their parents? Everybody who never heard of the kid. First thing I thought of, and you know his answer. Richie snorted. Well, think it over, for God's sake. He said every dream is a complete unit in itself. You, haven't you ever had nightmares about people you've never seen before? Yes, I suppose, but... All right. Even though they were projections of your subconscious, or whatever the hell it's called, they were complete, weren't they? Going somewhere, doing something, all on their own? Richie was silent. Where were they going? What were they doing? See, the kid says every dream, even ours, builds its own whole world, complete, with a past and, as long as you stay asleep, a future. Nonsense! What about us? When we sleep and dream? Or is the period when we're unconscious the time he's up and around? And keep in mind that everybody doesn't sleep at the same time. You're missing the point, Hank. I said it was complete, didn't I? And isn't sleeping part of the pattern? Have another drink, Max. You're slipping. What will you wake up to? My home. You would not understand. Then what? Then I sleep again and dream another world. Why did you kill George Sanderson? It is my eternal destiny to kill and suffer punishment. Why? Why? In my world I committed a crime. It is the punishment of my world, its destiny. Then try this one on for size, Richie said. That kid's frozen stiff with fear. Since he's going to have to wake up no matter what, then why not sit back and enjoy it? Kaplan's eyes widened. Hank, how soundly do you sleep? What's that got to do with it? I mean, do you ever dream? Of course. Ever get hold of a particularly vivid one? Falling downstairs like, being tortured, anything like that? Richie pulled at his drink. Sure you have. Kaplan gazed steadily at the clock. Almost midnight. Then try to remember, in that kind of dream, isn't it true that the pleasure or pain you feel is almost as real as if you were actually experiencing it? I remember once I had a nightmare about my old man. He caught me in the basement with a cigarette. I was eight or nine, I guess. He took down my pants and started after me with his belt. Hank, that hurt. Bad. It really hurt. So what's the point? In my dream I tried to get away from my old man. He chased me all over the basement. Well, it's the same with the kid, except his dream is a hundred times more vivid. That's all. He knows he'll feel that electric chair, feel the jolts frying into him, feel the death boiling up in his throat, just as much as if he were honest to God sitting there. Kaplan stopped talking. The two men sat quietly, watching the clock's visible progress. Then Richie leapt up and stalked over to the bar again. Doggone it, Max, he called. You're getting me fidgety now. Don't kid me, Kaplan said. You've been fidgety on your own for quite a while. I don't know how you ever made the grade as a criminal lawyer. You don't know the first thing about lying. Richie didn't answer. He poured the drink slowly. Look at you and Ruth, screaming at each other. And then there was the other tip-off. The way you defended the kid. Brilliant. Masterful. You'd never have done that for a common, open-and-shut little killer. Max, Richie said, you're nuts. Tell you what, at exactly 12.01, I'm going to take you out for the biggest, juiciest, rarest steak you have ever seen. On me. Then we'll get loaded and fall all over ourselves laughing. Richie fought away the sudden picture of steak, rare steak, 
with the blood spurting out, sizzling on an electric stove. The clock began to strike. Henry Ritchie and Max Kaplan stood very still. He uncoiled. The dry pop of hardened joints jabbed wakefulness into him, until finally the twenty-foot-long shell lay straight upon the streaming rocks. He opened his eyes, all of them, one by one. Across the bubbling pools, far away, past the white sewn geysers, he could see them coming, many of them, swiftly, giant slithering things with many arms and many legs. He tried to move, but the rock grew over him, and he could not move. By looking around, he could see the cliff's edge, and he remembered the thousand bottomless pits below. Gradually, the rest formed, and he remembered all. He turned to the largest creature. Did you tell them? He knew it would be a horrible punishment, worse than the last. The burning, far worse. Fingers began to unhinge the thick shell, peel it away from him leaving the viscous white tenderness bare to the heat and pain. Tell them. Make them understand. This is only a dream I'm having. They took the prisoner to the precipice, lingered a moment to give him a view of the dizziness and sucking things far below. Then nervous hands pressed him forward into space. He did not wake for a long time. The End of Tromerai by Charles Beaumont